Hallelujah. Did you come expecting tonight? Did you really come expecting tonight? Amen. You know what? You came expecting. You won't be disappointed. You know what? You don't look under the person up here that's preaching. You just simply look under God. You just see what he's got the answers for. Amen. You expect him to talk to you tonight. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, shake the person of the, shake the hand. Not the person. You can shake the person. Wives, be gentle with your husbands when you shake them, all right? Don't shake them too hard. Hallelujah. You can be seated. Hallelujah. Shake yourself. Shake that person. Wake them up. Amen. Is everybody having a good week? Hallelujah. God is good. Amen. God is good. All the time. Amen. Amen. Well, I got to share with you about a, what, a week and a half ago on Sunday night, and we got to talking a little bit about faith. Amen. How many of y'all were here on that Sunday night? Amen. We got to talking about faith, and we got to talking about how faith works. Amen. You know, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word. Amen. So in order to build our faith, you know, I've spent time in my early years of, of being a Christian trying to learn about faith, um, trying to learn everything I could because I didn't grow up in a church like this. I didn't grow up in a church that even, even told me about faith or what faith was. So once I heard about it and I heard that, you know what, I've got to have that in order to please God. Amen. For without faith, it is impossible to please God. And so I spent a lot of time trying to find out what is faith and where do I get it. And I would spend time just praying, God, you know, just give me faith. I don't know where to get it from. You know, and, and, and all I really found was that I just had an increased hunger for the Word. Amen. I had an increased hunger for the Word of God because faith comes by hearing and hearing the Word of God. And so as, you, as we continue to, uh, to study out faith and um, what faith is, you know, the Bible, we talked a little bit about a couple weeks ago, we talked a little bit about, you know, we walk by faith and not by sight. You know, to walk by faith is hard to do in this world today because there's so many natural things trying to pull us back. You know, there's so many things, you know, you deal with natural people every day. Amen. You, in, on your job, you deal with natural people every day. You deal with people that are, are, are coming to you at a different level than you're at, trying to pull you back to a level that they're on. And so to walk by faith in today's realm seems to be a little harder. Has anybody experienced that? You know, and then the Bible goes a little further and it says, you know, I don't just want you to walk by faith. <laughs> he says, I want you to live by it. He says, take every aspect of your life and make sure that you're using faith in that area. Amen. You know, I told you the story about um, when we were, uh, uh, we were back in Arkansas. We had graduated Raymond. We had already been to Peru. I'd went to Peru for, for five weeks after I graduated Raymond, and I'd met Pastor there, Pastor Varney. And... Um, we were back at Arkansas. The Lord had told us to go back, and, and that was hard enough in itself because we really didn't want to go back to Arkansas. And you know, the Lord had said, hey, he would spoke to me, and he said, hey, you know what, you, we want you to go back to Arkansas. And I said, like I told you, I said, you're going to have to tell my wife if you want us to go because Farrah really didn't want to go, and we weren't just really excited about that. But how many know that obedience will always lead you in a direction, in the right direction? Amen. And so Farron and I got on the same page and finally decided, you know, this is what we're supposed to do. And so we went back to Arkansas and, and we took over a small church. And during that time that we were in Arkansas, um, we went back in, in, in our eyes to the way it was before. You see, when, it, when God asks you to do something and to take a step of faith, a lot of people think that, you know what, when, when God asks me to do something that it's going to be easy to do. He, you know, it's that, you know what, yeah, God's going to provide. God's going to make a way, and things are going to happen. But he never said that it was going to be easy. Amen? 
He never said that, you know, when I ask you to step out and I ask you to go somewhere and I ask you to do something, that, that it's just going to be paved all the way. Amen? <laughs> Glory. And so in our eyes, because when we left Arkansas, we were youth pastors at a church, an Assembly of God church. We were youth pastors. And I'll tell you what, uh, there being a youth pastor, um, when we took over, there was about five kids left that didn't go with the other youth pastor. And so we started out our, our ministry with five people, if you will. Now, we were in a church of a couple hundred people, but our part of the ministry was five people. Amen. And so we started that out, you know, with five kids. And it was a hard road to go. Because I worked. I, I mean, I had a 40-hour a week job. I worked uh, at that time. I worked at a lumber yard. I worked out on, out on the yard at a lumber yard. And uh, so I worked 40 hours and I came home and I would take off my, my work hat and I'd put on my youth minister's hat. And so we had our, we had our um, youth on Monday nights. And so our Monday nights, my Monday consisted of getting up early and going to work, coming home after 5. Our youth started at 7 o'clock, and so um, I had to be ready to go by then. Amen. But I also had to, you know, a lot of people will sit back in ministry and they'll wait for people to come to them. And we had such a heart for the kids and wanted to change the lives of many kids that we, we took it a step further. We actually, we went out and got the kids. And so I would come home, I would get, get ready, I'd change, you know, and, and get ready and uh, uh, take a shower, make sure I smelled good, you know, after a hard day's work. And uh, I wanted them to receive on the right way, you know. I didn't want them to go out in the spirit, that, you know. Yeah. So, but... Uh, so I'd come home and I'd do that. And then, you know what? I, I would go pick up a van load of kids in town. And so I'd pick up a van load of kids there in town and bring them and drop them off. And then I'd go pick up another van load of kids in another town that was about 20 minutes away. And so in the process of doing all of this, we went from about five kids to about 50 kids. But, you know, I kept instilling in these kids that they need to, they need to continually look to God. You know, it's not, it's not the person up front preaching that you need to be looking to or you need to put up on a, on, a, on a pedestal because, you know what, we make mistakes too. And so by doing that, when I left that youth group in 99 and went to Ramah, uh, we came back a, about a year and a half later, and, and that group had grown from 50 to 75, they had stayed and continued in the word. Amen. They didn't leave with me. They didn't say, all right, you know what? Well, Brother Adam's gone. We're, we're leaving the group. We're going to leave you with five again. You know what I mean? The next person that stepped in stepped into a group of 50. And they took it to 75. And, and um, the other day we were uh, talking to some people. And, you know, there are, uh, I believe, five of the kids that were in our youth group in Arkansas are now youth pastors. Amen. So instilling into our youth, you know, it, it took a lot of time to work all day to come home to go get a, a, a van load of kids in town, much less drop those kids off and then drive another 20 minutes to pick up another van load and then to come back and then to have service, to worship, then to preach, then to do a little fellowship, and then the kids had to get home again. Amen? Amen. And I mean, I, I didn't have people that were willing to work with me. I didn't have people that were willing to come and volunteer their time and to give of their time into the ministry. You know, they just thought, oh, that's just the youth ministry. You know, let them take care of that. And so, you know what? We're valuable in what we do and how we do it. And so that's how we started ministry. And so I was thinking, you know, on our way to Ramah, I was thinking, man, this is going to be good. You know, God's called us out here. God, we knew we were supposed to go to Ramah. You know, on our first trip to Ramah, we were actually driving down there to, uh, to just check it out. You know, I mean, we'd never been to Tulsa. I don't, I mean, been out of Arkansas once, I think, <laughs> you know. But, uh, you know, we'd never really been to Tulsa, and so we were going to check out Ramah. You know, what's the school like? You know, what's the atmosphere like? What do we need to do? And so we went down there, and so on the way down there, I mean, we had, we had $100 in our pocket. That's all we had. 
We were going to go get a hotel room, stay the night, check things out, turn around, come back the next day. And so on our way down there, driving down there, hit something in the middle of the road and just shatters one of our tires. And so now we're on the side of the road putting one of those little donuts on there. I don't know how annoying that is. And so now we're driving down the road with one of those little donuts on there, you know, we're thinking, man, I hope people behind me see that because they'll know why I'm driving 45 miles an hour, you know. I know I used to get annoyed at people. But anyway, so, you know, I mean, so we're, we, we stop at the next town, and, and, you know, we have to shell out 80 bucks for a tire. And so now we're down to 20 bucks, you know. So we're thinking, well, I guess we'll go down today and, Turn around and come back today, you know. Fill the car up with gas, and it wasn't four bucks a gallon then, amen. But, you know, but, you know, we'll turn around and come back home. But, you know, we got down there, and God was faithful to us because he knew that there was something that we needed to receive while just being down there that weekend. And so we just, I don't even remember how we met the people that we met. But God had sent somebody across our path that uh, actually we sat and we had lunch with, and you know what? They said, you know what? Here, we just feel like we need to give this to you. And they gave us $100. You know, following God in obedience, he'll make sure that you get and you do what you need to do. Amen? He'll make sure that the direction that you're going, that you'll end up where you need to be. You know, I'm thinking after having the flat, I'm thinking, you know, am I really supposed to be going? You know, is, is this just a sign that says, turn around, go back home? You know, I mean, we, we weren't even out of Arkansas at that time. And in Oklahoma, I'm thinking, it'd be real easy to just turn around and go back home. You know, but to follow that inward witness. You know, we have an inward, inward being. And, you know, we all have, God has a plan for each one of us. You know, God has things that he expects us to do. Amen? See, a lot of times people think that it's their choice on what they do with their life. And really, you know, God expects you to do certain things. Amen? Now, have we missed it? I've missed it plenty of times and not done what God has asked me to do. But in continuing with the plan that God had for us, you know, we did. We ended up going to Ramah and ended up, you know, and, and, and when we turned around and we went back after we graduated Ramah, we were there for two and a half years, we graduated, before we graduated, we started doing some traveling ministry. And uh, it was the February of um, 02 that we moved back to Arkansas. That God had put on our heart, it's time to go back. There's some things that I need to teach you there. And so when we went back to Arkansas, you know, I mean, when we were in Tulsa, I, I got a good job with the bank. God had blessed us. You know, I'd, I'd mentioned to you that, you know, they, they offered me so much money to work at the bank, and, and you know, I was just happy, you know, to, to get that. And then they said, hey, you know what, we'll give you two more dollars an hour if you'll just go over on this bad side of town. And I said, let's go. You know, I'll take that, I'll take that increase of $2 an hour, amen. Let's go. I'll go to the bad part of town. It doesn't matter. You know, and, and time after time that we were there, um, I, would, I would joke around with the new people and tell them, I would say, hey, now listen, if you don't get cussed out at least twice a week, you're not doing your job. And they just look at me and laugh until they get cussed out twice a week. But, <laughs> you know, it was just walking by faith. But, you know, while I was working there at Arvest Bank in Tulsa, uh, my second year at Rama, um, there was this young lady that I worked with. And this lady, she was, um, she was hard into drugs into alcohol, um, very much partied all the time, and, and let people know about it. And so, you know, when you, when you work on your job and you live on, day after day and you get to know people, you know, you don't necessarily just have to go up to somebody and just start telling them about the gospel. Because they're going to read your life, and they're going to find out, is, is what you have what I want? Are you pushing what you believe on me or are you allowing me to look at your life and see how you're living it? And are you living your life right? Amen? And so in this walk, you know, I just, 
I just told the Lord, and I tell the Lord at, at every job that I've ever had, Lord, if there's somebody here that you need me to minister to, I'm open for it. But I said, you need to open the door up. You need to make a way for me to be able to minister to these people. Because I will not, because you know what? I, it's a job. Amen. They're paying me to do something. Amen. They were paying me to open accounts, to, you know, to do whatever, uh, new loans and things like that. And so it really wasn't my place to bring my religion, if you will, except for the way that I live my life. And so I told God, hey, you open up a door and, and, and I'll walk through it. And so there was one night, this, this young lady and I, we were closing the bank and the bank that we worked in was inside of a Walmart. And, um, and so we were the closers that night. And so we were sitting there and, and, you know, she was very into, she would have her, her novels that she would bring and read if we didn't have any customers or she would play internet poker or whatever, you know, I mean, they're at work, you know, if she didn't have work, that's what she did. And so one night we were there and I'd, I'd asked the Lord, you know, and I, I continually prayed for my coworkers. And I asked him, Lord, you know what, if there is somebody or something that you want me to share with them, you just let me know. You open a door and I'll be happy to walk through that door. And so we were there that night, and she's, she's writing a paper for school. She's going to school, to college, and she's writing a paper for college. And so we're sitting there, and we're talking a little bit, and she's typing up her paper while we're at work and uh, didn't have any customers. And, and she asked me this question. She goes, um, she said, I'm writing this paper about religion. She said, can you tell me about yours? Yeah. <laughs> I can tell you about mine. Put the lid back on that, didn't I? I didn't realize I put the lid back on. And so God had opened up a door, amen, for me to be able to minister to her. And so I ministered to her that night and just, just told her about Jesus, told her about the, the salvation and what Jesus can do for you and how he can change your life. And this is what I believe and this is why I believe this. And this is what, what we do and how we do it and where we go. And, you know, and this, this, is, this is my life. And I told her that night, I said, you know what, I, you, I don't have to pray with you tonight if you want to receive Jesus as your Lord. I said, but I'll tell you what, you go home, pray this simple little prayer to accept Jesus into your life. And I said, he'll come into your life. And so you know what? The next day, she comes back to work. And there was just something different about her. I mean, you could tell the atmosphere around her had changed. She came in, and, and there were several people there, and we were closing um, that night also. And uh, after everybody else had left and we were there, um, I said, uh, I looked at her and I said, you prayed last night, didn't you? She looked at me like, how'd you know? I said, you know, something's changed about you. I said, God is all over you right now. And she said, you know what? She said, I went home last night. She said, as soon as I got home, she said, I knelt down at my bed. And I prayed that prayer that you told me to pray. She says, you know, I woke up the next morning, I had absolutely no craving for a cigarette. She said, you know, she says, I usually don't come into work until later because we close. She says, usually I will drink a little bit during the morning. She said, but you know what, I didn't have any desire to drink. She said, I actually took a drink of something and it didn't taste good. Amen. You see, if you'll be obedient to God... And you'll listen. And it wasn't very hard for me to find out that, you know, can you tell me about your religion? It was a pretty open door. Amen. I mean, it's not like it took me to pray for a while and find out, is, am I supposed to pray with her tonight or tell her or not? You know, I mean, it's, that was a pretty easy one to walk through. Amen. And so, you know, but, you know, I, w I went out in Walmart that night and I bought her a Bible. And I brought it back to her because she's like, you know, I, I don't have a Bible. I, I don't know which one's good. She's, she actually said, I actually went and looked at some before work today. I mean, this is the day after she got saved. Amen? And so I went and bought her a Bible and brought it back and gave it to her. 
and uh, told her some, uh, some of the, the chapters to read, and I started seeing her in church. And uh, I haven't talked to her in, in several years, so I, I, I do pray and just believe that she is still following God. But you know what? If you're obedient... And you listen to what God's trying to tell you because he has a plan for all of us. You know, your life, you have a mark that you're trying to hit. Amen? I mean, and it's, it's almost like a diagram. You know, you have a mark up here and you're down here. And you know what? The, obviously, the shortest distance between two points is, thank you, a straight line. I feel like sometimes in my life I've kind of been, you know, I've got off my mark and off my line just a little bit. But, you know, on that line, if you'll just imagine a graph, and you'll just imagine, you know, you can see your point down here, and you can see the mark that you're trying to hit on that graph, and you just draw a straight line up. You know, it's not like the stock market. It doesn't have to dip way down or come way up or, you know what I mean? You just stay on that line, amen? But you, you look at that graph, and, and if you look at the graph paper, and there's several lines that cross your line. Amen? And God showed me one day, He said, you know what, if you'll stay on that line that I've prepared for you, He said, all these other people, you'll meet them exactly when you're supposed to meet them. And that girl that I talked to that night, she was one of those lines that we met exactly where we were supposed to meet. And from that point forward, she was able to live the life that God had for her. You know, my point, uh, point on my line was when, when I started youth ministry. And then I, I went to Rama, And then after Rama, I went to Peru and I met Pastor Varney down in, down in Peru. You know, God takes you thousands of miles to meet a man that you'll be working for one day. Go figure that one out. We were only a couple of hundred miles away. It would have been a lot easier if he'd have just let me come up to Topeka to meet him. You know what I mean? He didn't have to take me to Peru. I'd have been all right. <laughs> you know, missions wasn't really on my heart to do that until I went. Amen. But nevertheless, he took me to Peru to meet Pastor Varney. And I met uh, Darian, uh, the former youth pastor. Uh, Y'all know who he is. He's, starting, he's actually starting a church in Pryor, Oklahoma. Amen. So uh, continue to pray for him. I know that they're going to do good things down there. And so Darren and I are, we are best friends. But you know, we met in Peru of all places. And so in Peru, I didn't really meet Pastor Varney. I mean, I did. It was just like, a, you know, hi, how are you type deal. You know, and then we were back out ministering on the streets of Peru Hundreds of people. I think we saw over 17,000 people get saved when I was there. Amen. And so <clears throat> that was one of my marks on my graph. You know, all of those people that got saved, their marks started on my line. And so now as they are saved and they're, they're, doing, they're living their life, somewhere along the way there's other people that they're supposed to meet. Same with you guys. There's people in your life you're supposed to meet. Amen. God has a race for you that we are running. Amen. With patience that we're doing this race. And he has planned out a path for us. And the path that we're following that God has planned out, he's already got people that we're supposed to meet along that path. And so after we, we, we were in, in Peru and then uh, we left and we went back after obviously we got back to Tulsa. And uh, we left in 02, February of 02, and went back to Arkansas. And so while we were in Arkansas, um, I went back to doing construction because there wasn't a bank in Arkansas that could pay me what I needed to do. So I went back to doing construction. And I told you the story about how God had told me in, um, at the men's meeting of, of 2002 uh, down at Raymond, God told me to quit my job and go to Bank of America. And I told you I quit my job. I went to Bank of America, and they didn't have any jobs. <laughs> yeah. And so I told you what I did. I went deer hunting. <laughs> Hallelujah. What else do you do when you go somewhere and there's not a job open? <laughs> go deer hunting. 
I'll tell you what, get it, you know, just go out in the woods and go deer hunting. Man, you'll have a great time. I love deer hunting. Love hunting, period. Shooting things, blowing up things, you know, it's just part of being a man. Amen. <laughs> and so, you know, and then and then Bank of America called a week later and said, Hey, we've got a job for you. And so you know what, that step of faith that I, that I stepped out there when he said, quit your job, go to Bank of America, it was, just, it was just a test of faith is all it was. God was expecting me to follow what he told me to do. <clears throat> but at that, um, at that men's conference in, uh, in 2002, if you'll excuse me, I know y'all all want a drink of this, but I'm going to go ahead and get one if that's all right with you. Thank you. Amen. <clears throat> so at, the, at that men's conference in 2002, when God had told me to quit my job doing construction, I used to build houses, and go to Bank of America, that same men's conference, God did something else in my life. Now, I was, I, I, I just told you I loved to hunt. I loved to deer hunt. And when we had left and we had went to Ramah, we didn't have any money to go to Ramah. And so what I did was I sold all of my guns and Farrah sold her bedroom suit that she really loved. And that was the money that we used to move to Rama and to pay, you know, our rent for the first couple of months and utilities and all that stuff. That's the money we used. And so <clears throat> at that men's conference, I'd been looking for a, a Browning 270 short mag. And if you don't know what that is, I'm sorry, but... It's, it's a type of gun. It's what I love to deer hunt with. I love hunting with 270. And, uh, you know, when I go and buy a gun, I don't necessarily, you know, it doesn't have to be expensive for me, but it's just got to feel right. I know y'all don't have, some of y'all know what I mean. Some of you don't. That's all right. <laughs> you know, but I couldn't find a Browning 270 short mag that I really wanted. I make several different models of it. And I could not find one that I wanted. And so I had, I had $600 that I was going to spend on the gun. And I, I had some other money that I was going to spend on a scope, you know, four or $500 on a scope too. But, and so this 600 bucks that I had, so I, I'm, I'll go, well, you know what? We're going to the men's conference this year. I'm just going to take the money with me. And, uh, you know, I, surely there's a place in Tulsa that I can find a gun that I like. And so while we were in Tulsa, whenever we had some off time from the men's conference, I was hitting the sporting stores, and I was looking for the gun that I wanted, and I found it. I found the one that I wanted. It felt right. When I held it up, it just, it just fit perfect. And so I go to buy it, and they asked me for my driver's license. And I gave them my driver's license, and they said, I'm sorry, we can't sell you the gun. I said, why can't you sell me the gun? They said, because you're out of state. They said, and we don't have one of our sporting stores in your state, and because we don't have one in your state that can help you if, if anything goes wrong with it, we can't sell you the gun. And so I had a friend with me that lived in Tulsa. So I looked at him, and I said, hey, you want to buy a gun? He goes, sure. He goes, wonder which one I should buy. I said, how about this one? And so he went to buy the gun for me. And, uh, and so he pulled out. We were standing there, and the guy was standing right there, and I'm just sitting there talking to him. I said, all right, he's going to buy a gun. He said, okay. So he pulls out his driver's license. They run his driver's license, and he had just moved two weeks earlier to a new address. And because it wasn't the same address that was on his license, yeah, that's kind of what I was thinking. You know, I'm sitting there thinking, Lord, I just want this gun. You know, is, can, can, can I, come on. And so I'm a little, I'm, I'm a little upset, <laughs> just a little. And so I'm like, okay, that's fine. And so we go back to the men's conference. That night at the men's conference, um, I don't even remember who was speaking that night. It may have been uh, Reggie Scarborough. And uh, that night at the men's conference, the Lord put on my heart, to sow that $600 into somebody's life. 
Now, $600 is not the biggest that I've ever given, and I'm, not, I'm, I'm saying that for a specific reason. I'm not sitting here trying to brag about what I've given because I'm not going to tell you all that I've given. But for the specific reason that this $600 was probably the greatest investment that God has ever had me give in my life. Number one, it was for a gun. <laughs> All right. <laughs> that in and of itself should just say something, you know what I mean? And I had saved that, you know, I mean, I mean, it's not like, you know, we, we, we were doing okay, but, you know, I had saved quite a bit to get this 600 bucks just so I could buy this gun. But I, I don't remember which night it was specifically, but the Lord put on my heart and he says, you need to give that $600 to that person right there. And so I walked up to that person and, uh, I said, I don't know if you're, what you're expecting. I said, but I'm expecting some good things from God. And I gave him that $600. Man, I just busted out in tears. I just started bawling like a baby. I felt like, man, I can't even hold these things back. Here I am sowing this seed and I can't even quit crying. You know, and I mean, it was not that it was for a gun. That's not why I was crying, all right? That's not it. It was just God, all right? It was just God all over me, you know, that I was given this money. <laughs> it really wasn't because it was for a gun. <laughs> but, <laughs> and so God is just all over me, and I give, I give this man this $600, and, man, I, I'm crying on his shoulder, and I'm sitting there thinking, man, I am just looking like an idiot, but I can't quit crying. And I'm thinking, I don't know what this guy's thinking about me, you know, and, and anyway... And so, that $600 that I was obedient in giving um, produced more in my life than I could have ever imagined. You know, we always talk about when we sow specific seeds for things that, you know, we're expecting. You know, if you sow money, most of us are expecting money. If you sow a car, you know what they've taught us, you know, believe for a car. But that money that I sowed... Um, I never received necessarily money back for that. But the, the man that I gave that money to that night was Pastor Varney. And that night that I gave him that money and that God had told me, you need to sow that money into his life because there's some things that I need to do with you. You know, we, we came up and we visited. And you know what? Pastor Varney spent... When we were still pastor in Arkansas, we came up one weekend. And that's when we were still in the other building. And that's when he made fun of the town I lived in. I don't know if y'all remember that or not. Bee Branch, Arkansas. Yeah. And so, and so, uh, it was funny. But, and so he spent a weekend with us. Was just in my, in my mind and just sowed, sowed into us time and I'm thinking man this 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 guy is a pastor of a of a good sized church and you know here I've got 25 people that I'm pastoring and you know for him to do that to me was just I just, it just didn't make sense to me and so it was um you know I didn't realize I hadn't really thought about that money for a couple of years and God had put on our heart to come to Topeka, Kansas. And we came up here and visited, and my wife, she really wasn't impressed with the town. You know, we're thinking, I'm sorry if you're from here. I'm sorry if you love the town. You know, we're thinking capital city. You know, we're thinking, you know, we just come from Tulsa. You know, five, 600,000 people. You know, we're expecting... You know, and we go to Wanamaker, and then we come back, and we ask, where's the rest of the town? <laughs> they said, it's on Topeka Boulevard. And we were like, okay. <laughs> and so, you know, it wasn't just something that, you know, that, that necessarily impressed us in the natural. I'm sorry. I'm not trying to put out Topeka. It's been a blessing in our life. <laughs> but God started putting in our heart of April of 03. Yeah, April of 03, to move up here. 
And for three months, I fought with God. Because I told God, you know what? I know you told me to go to Arkansas. And I didn't want to go to Arkansas. But I went anyway, God. And now we're pastoring this church. And by April, we had about 50 people in the church. And I said, you know what? The church is doing okay. We started with 15 people. You know, and, and a year, a little over a year later, you know, we've got 50 people. I said, we're doing okay. I said, they don't need me in, to, in Topeka, Kansas. <laughs> yes, I know my English isn't cr really correct, but that's okay. You understand. And so for three months, I would get down on my knees whenever I'd start praying, and Topeka, Kansas would come up in my heart. I would get up. Quit praying. And I would tell my flesh, you know what? That's, you just need to quit. I'm going deer hunting or something, all right? I didn't have a gun, though. But <laughs> so for three months, God continually, April, May, June, he continually said, you need to go to Topeka. You need to go to Topeka. And I'm asking fair and fair. I was like, I don't want to go either. And so for three months, I fought with God, but I could not get peace in my heart. You know, the Bible says in Colossians 3.15 to let the peace in your heart rule your life. And so I could not get peace in my life. And so finally we said, well, we're going to go visit. One more time. Spy out the land, if you will. I wasn't committing to coming. And so we got up here. And we were at the, um, I think it was the Marriott that's by Chili's, right there behind Chili's. We were at the Marriott. <clears throat> and uh, one of the rooms that had a balcony on it. 2 a.m. in the morning, Fair and I are out on that balcony. We brought the kids with us. Fair and I are out on that balcony at 2 a.m. in the morning. And we're, we're asking God, is this where we are supposed to be? And we both got the answer of, yes, this is where you are supposed to be. And so we said, okay, we will be obedient. So we moved up here that August. It was, it was before the men's conference that year when we first got here in 03. Um, at some point when I had first got here, pastor had actually let me preach. I don't know if any of y'all remember that. It's the first time I preached here. It was over in the other building. And uh, we were actually having, um, at that time, we were doing a short service, and then we were having classes afterwards, life groups afterwards, had the different classes that we were doing. And so pastor actually let me preach. And I'm thinking in my head, why in the world are you allowing me to? Not that I'm not a good preacher, all right? That's not why I was saying that. But I'm thinking, you really don't know me that well. You really don't know anything about me. You know, I mean, I'm, I'm from Arkansas, and I went to Rama and I went back to Arkansas, and now I'm in Topeka, you know. And, and, and honestly, I'll be, it did not make sense to my mind as a minister on why he would allow me in his pulpit. Because ministers are very protective of who they let preach. And especially Pastor Varney, since I've been here and I've realized how protective he is of who he allows in the pulpit. And so it was that men's conference that year that we, we had came up and I came up with the guys. And on the way back, Pastor asked me to ride back with him. He said, hey, won't you come ride back with me from the men's conference? He said, we can talk about a few things. And so on the way back, I just asked him, I said, Pastor, I said, I've just got to ask you a question, something that is just, I don't understand. I said, you really don't know me. You really don't know who I am. You don't know anything about me. You know I went to Rama, and then I pastored a church in Arkansas, and, you know, you don't know a whole lot about me. I said, why did you let me preach that night? And it was at that point that I started to understand what my seed of $600 had actually done. Because he turned and he looked at me and he said, when you gave me that $600, that showed me your heart. And from that time, 
my mind just started running through everything and every event that I, I had that, that had anything to do with Topeka, Kansas. And the time that Pastor had spent with me and the times that he had sowed into my life up until that point and, and being, a, being allowed and, and uh, privileged to, to, to preach that one night and everything just started running through my head that, you know what, I've been looking at the wrong type of harvest off of this money. God needed me to be obedient to sow a seed that was precious to me. Amen? He needed me to sow that seed into somebody else's life in order to get me to a place that I needed to be. And so that money that I sowed and was obedient in listening to the Holy Spirit has helped me and showed Pastor my heart to the point that, you know, I, I guess I could say to the point of where I am now. Because I'll, I'll be honest with you. Sometimes when I look at myself, I'm thinking, you know what, I am so inadequate in what I do. You, you know, I, I, was, uh, I, I didn't necessarily go to college except for Rama. I was raised on a dairy farm in the hills of Arkansas. And honestly, when God called me, that scripture that says the foolish things of this world will confound the wise, that's literally where I saw myself as the foolish things of this world. Why would anybody want to listen to or want to receive from me? But that $600 that I sowed that night opened up doors for me to see and to understand and to realize what God actually had for me. And opened up, you know, and it simply was being obedient to what God asked me to do. You know, he took me to Peru and he allowed me to meet Pastor Farney and Darian. And then a couple of years later or whatever, you know, he, a, year, a little over a year later, he had me sow that money. And at that time, I had absolutely no idea what that would produce in my life. But to be obedient to what God, you know, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you, if God's put something on your heart to do, whether it makes sense or not, what that's going to produce in your life will be beyond what you can even imagine. I never imagined myself being an associate pastor at a church like this. Of this caliber within the faith realm. I mean, pastor goes back and teaches at Rhema. You know, the caliber of what we get here is what they get at Rhema. Amen? And for me to be where I'm at today and to look back and think, you know what? I, yeah, I've missed it there and there, but yeah, I did hit the mark there and there. And so, you know, I just encourage you tonight. You know, if God is putting on your heart to do something, you need to do it. Because God has got places for you to go. People for you to cross paths with. That he cannot get you there unless you are obedient to what he's asking you to do. Amen? And so I just encourage you tonight. I encourage you that if God is asking you to do something or, or if he's asked you to do something, you know, just be obedient. Because God really does want to do something in your life. And he has got a plan for you. And he wants that plan to prosper. But you know what? We do have a, we have a part to play in that. I could have said, when he asked me to go to Peru, I could have said, well, I did say no at first. But I could have continued to say no, I guess, is what I could say. Because I told him when he, when, when he told me, hey, I want you to go to Peru. You know, I, I did look at that. I was at, in, in class at Rama, listening to Jim Andrews. And he asked me to go to Peru and serve that man for five weeks. And I looked at the chair next to me, and I, look, I did. I was like, she missed it. She's not here today. That was for her. I was like, that couldn't have been for me. But God said, no, it is for you. And then he did provide the way because, 
I had, you know, I didn't have the money to go, and he provided the money that I needed to go through different resources. And so that choice that I made to listen to God, number one, to go to Ramah, number two, to go to Peru, then to sow money that to me was very precious. You know, it was all steps. It was all steps that I did not have a clue where it was leading to. But I'm so grateful today that I am where I am. Because I am exactly where God wants me to be. And my wife and I could not be happier doing anything else right now. We are satisfied with what we're doing. You know, a lot of people are unsatisfied in the job that they're doing. And I spent years like that. And I spent years doing ministry and working. You know, for five, six years, we, we worked full-time and we ministered full-time. And we worked full-time and we ministered full-time. And we just, you know, one day we're going to be in the ministry. But didn't have a clue on how we were going to get there. Even when we pastored the church back in Arkansas, we worked full-time. And we pastored full-time. But we said, you know what, one day, one day we're just going to be in full-time ministry and we're going to be able to give everything we've got to God and had not a clue at the things that God had already had set up for me and for my wife. But just simply being obedient at specific times that he asked us to do things, put us in position to do what we're doing today. Amen? So I encourage you. Follow that peace that you have. Make sure that whatever direction that you're going, that the peace of God is there. Amen. And that the direction that you're heading is the direction that God has for you. Because I have no doubt in my mind that every person in this room, God has a path for you to walk on. And he has a path that he needs you to walk on. See, we always think that, you know, we need God. Amen. And we do. We need God. But you know what? God needs us. Because he set up everything that he can do on this earth, he needs you to do it. We are the body of Christ. Amen. And we are to walk out and to perform the things that God needs us to. Amen. Let's pray. Father, I thank you tonight. Lord, I thank you for the things that you are doing through this congregation. I thank you for the plans right now in this congregation. I thank you that the plans right now, Father, that you have, that you're bringing back to each person's memory, that you're telling them what they need to do, showing them the next step that they need to take. And Father, they may not realize right now the path that they need to go to get to that place, but if they'll simply, Father, if they'll simply obey you, you'll take them where they need to be. And so, Father, I thank you for each person in this room that they will follow your plan. They will do what you ask them to do. And this generation, Father, will be the generation that wins this world for Christ. Now, if you'll just keep your heads bowed and your eyes closed just for a minute, because I know most everybody that's in here, but, you know, I don't know everybody. But I don't want to leave.